we're still going through our red letters. We're going to be in this through Labor Day, and then after that, we'll move into something different for our fall uh, uh, Sundays. But um, how many of you have ever been asked the question, which is the greatest? It can be anything. In my house, my kids have asked me numerous times, Dad, which is the greatest, Star Wars or Marvel? I, that's a big discussion. I mean, there's a lot that that, that entails because my son and I, we've watched a lot of the Marvels. We watched all the Star Wars original movies, uh, and, and it's this debate, and they need to know that dad, which, and I'm like, well, and I'm not going to give my answer. You'll have to just guess where I stand in that. Um, I, there's, it goes back and forth. I mean, have you seen the latest Star Wars stuff? Some of it's a little iffy. Some of the Marvel stuff's a little iffy. So there's this, but it's, just, it's a discussion. We want to know the greatest. They want to know my opinion. We, we talk about the greatest empire in world history. All of you, I'm sure, have an opinion on that. Who's the greatest leader? Who's the greatest American leader? All these things, and, and, they, and the questions can keep going. We can talk about books. We can talk about musicians. We can talk about sports heroes. Oh, my goodness, who's the greatest team in the world for football? The Packers, of course, right? Yeah, I, don't ask me. I support them because my son supports them. It's this want to know who is the greatest, what is the greatest. And it doesn't, it's nothing new though. Here's the thing. We, we go back and we see there was an interest in this type of question back in Jesus' time. And so we come to this, this portion of scripture where this religious leader asks Jesus the most important, what's the greatest commands is the question he poses. But Jesus, being Jesus, can answer it how he wants. And he doesn't give him just one command. He actually gives him two. He says all the law and the prophets depend on these two commands. And both of these commands are grounded in our responsibility to love. We are to love God supremely. We are to love others genuinely. Our response to these two commandments expose our hearts. They, they lay bare our souls and reveal what matters most to us. If you ask yourself the questions, what do you cherish? What is of supreme value in your life? What would your answers be? Those are some deep questions. And if you, you take the time to, to consider them genuinely and honestly answer them, we come to see where our heart is. And so this morning, we're in Mark chapter 12, looking at this interaction between this scribe and Jesus. And, and normally, when we see these exchanges, we know what's happening, right? The scribes are trying to trip up Jesus. They're trying to trap him into saying something where they can come at him. But this, this was a, a genuine question. This was a person looking for a real answer. There, there was no deceit here. It's just a longing to understand the greatest commandment. He wanted clarification from someone that understood these commands, and, and he got more than he bargained for when Jesus gives him an answer. So let's go ahead and read our main passage, starting in Mark chapter 12, verse 28. One of the scribes approached when he heard them debating and saw that Jesus answered them well. He asked him, which command is the most important of all? Jesus answered, the most important is, listen, Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, and with all your strength. The second is love your neighbor as yourself. There's no command greater than these. Then the scribe said to him, you're right, teacher. You've correctly said that he is one and there is no one else except him. And to love him with all your heart, with all your understanding, with all your strength, and to love your neighbor as yourself is far more important than all the burnt offerings and sacrifices. And when Jesus saw that he answered wisely, he said to him, you are not far from the kingdom of God. And no one dared to question him any longer. So here this scribe, this, this religious lawyer, he, he's come to Jesus and he's, he's listened to Jesus answer these questions. He's listened to Jesus talk with these other Jewish leaders and, and he takes note that Jesus answers these questions very well. I love that he's taking note of this because he's looking for a real answer. He wants to hear the truth. And so he, he's witnessed these questions. He realizes, I'm going to get the type of answer I'm looking for if I'll pose this question to Jesus. We look around our world today. So many people are answering questions, and they're, they're, they're doing it with empty words and no substance. Let's be honest. There are a lot of people that say a lot of things where they actually say nothing at all. 
But Jesus, when he's asked these questions, his answers go far deeper than what, what people are looking for. And so without malice, this man asked Jesus this question. And it's one that, that they had batted around a lot in these religious circles. They would talk about this, which command's the most important of all. And to us, it may seem like the, a really easy answer, but, but it's not as, as easy as it seems. The, the rabbinic uh, tradition had identified 613 commands in the first five books of the Bible. And 365 of those were negative and 248 were positive. Some they would call what, what, what we might call light. They, they made less demand while others were viewed as this, these heavy commands. They had severe repercussions for disobedience. Commands were so vast. There, there, there was a, this was a valid question. And so you can see how it, it could be confusing. And so the scribe asked Jesus to declare himself. And, and Jesus gladly obliges. And, and he, his answer takes us to the core of what really matters in this life. See, when Jesus answers the question, he gets to the heart of our existence and how we're to follow his example. It, it goes much deeper than just words. It goes into actions and, and, and changes of heart in us. And so the scribe seemed to understand what Jesus was saying. He not only affirms this, he, he states it in such a way that indicates he does grasp the difference between the, the letter and the spirit of the law. I, I love this. Sometimes when we get asked a question, our answer may not sound like, this guy showed Jesus, I, I get what you're saying, Jesus. I'm going to tell you back what I, I heard you say. I'm going to affirm this. And, and so Jesus, Jesus uh, uh, commends him. He says, you've got that right. You're listening. You're understanding. But, but you're, you're not quite in the kingdom. You're not in the kingdom yet. We need to take away from this, this little note here that he's one of the scribes. He's, he's, he's with this group that's always trying to trip Jesus up. We've got to recognize that not everybody in the opposing sides are, are, are bad all the time, right? I mean, he's, he's genuinely wanting to come and, and get this answer. He's an individual here who, who, who was open to the gospel. He's open to God's movement in his life. And Jesus' final words to him permit are, are, are there to encourage him to continue down the path he was on. And, and, and it's not recorded whether or not he does. I'd love to know if this man really fully came to Christ and, and to come to be part of the kingdom. But when we look at Jesus' answer here, we see that these commands weren't just for this man. They weren't just for that time. They're for us as well. It wasn't just for this scribe. It's, it's for us. Jesus first tells us we are commanded to love God supremely. In fact, we're, we're to love God for who he is. We got to get this right up front. We love God for who he is, right? Jesus quotes what Israel called the, the Shema, and it's found in Deuteronomy chapter 6, and, and that's what he says. He says, listen, Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your strength. I, I know we've heard this time and time again, but do we understand it? This confession, it was, it was recited by every devout Jew, each and, each and every morning and evening. It, it was, as it is important to Judaism, as we might consider the Lord's Prayer or the Apostles' Creed to Christianity. The Lord our God, the Lord is one. It's the heart and soul of the Hebrew faith. Yes, yes of, of Christianity. Yahweh is God's covenant name declared to his people. Yahweh is our God and our only God. Yahweh is one. He is unified. He is unique in essence and, and existence. He alone is God. There is no other. This is a powerful statement. One of uniqueness, one of exclusivity. Our, our God is God alone and our worship, our love, our devotion, and our allegiance must be exclusively to him or he will not accept it. Teachers and theologians, they, they can debate all they want, but Jesus begins by bringing them back to the fundamentals, the non-negotiables of the faith. And we should love this, this, this God because of who he is. He's our God. What kind of God is he? Exodus tells us, he describes him as, as perfect in his gracious love and his pure justice. Furthermore, the context of the Shema is instructive to love God, to obey his commands and statutes all the days of your life. 
To love God means you will teach these commandments to your children and your grandchildren. You'll teach them when you sit and when you walk, when you lie down and when you rise up throughout the day, remembering he is the God, the God who who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the the place of slavery. To, To love God supremely means you will not follow other gods. We are called to follow only the one true God, to declare him to our world. And now we know the Israelites, they they struggled with this almost at every turn. There were times they would turn to other gods, and yet, yet God keeps pursuing them. He keeps seeking to correct them, to draw them back to him. And in Deuteronomy, Deuteronomy, we see why, because our God is a jealous God. Our God is a jealous God. Look what we read in Deuteronomy chapter 6. Do not follow other gods, the gods of the peoples around you, for the Lord your God who is among you is a jealous God. Otherwise, the Lord your God will become angry with you and obliterate you from the face of the earth. This is one of those attributes that sometimes we don't like to look at, we don't like to consider. We kind of like to just, we like a a nice picture of our God who's loving and and kind, but he's a jealous God. We read this right here. God doesn't want others taking what is rightfully his. He he demands from those whom he has loved and redeemed utter and absolute loyalty and, and will vindicate his claim by stern action against them if they betray his love by unfaithfulness. That's who our God is. We are to love him for who he is. We are to love him with our all. What what does that mean? What does that look like? Go back to, to verse 30 in our main passage where It says this, love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, and with all your strength. You see that repetition of the word all? We we see it repeated four times, and, and it emphasizes the comprehensive nature of how we are to love Yahweh, how we are to love our God. It's, it's not love him with a piece of your heart. It's not love him with a portion of your mind or, or a part of your strength. It's love him with all you have, everything. It calls for this total response of love and devotion to God. Indeed, heart, soul, mind, and strength. They're not, they're not intended as a psychological analysis of human personality. It's a call to love God wholly, to love him completely with everything you have. One author said it does not take much for a man to be a believer, but it takes all there is of him. He wants it all. God's not asking for part of you. He requires every piece of you. The the heart speaks to our emotions, the the real me on the inside. The soul speaks to the spirit, the the self-conscious life. The the mind speaks to our intelligence and thought life. The strength speaks to our bodily powers, perhaps even the will. And yeah, there's overlap in these categories, but the truth is God is never satisfied with anything less than the devotion of our whole life for the whole duration of our lives. That's a tall order. This is the command that that Jesus says, here it is. We're to love our God in this way. When we think about how we love God, do we love him with our all? Do we love him with every piece of ourselves? We we need to ask ourselves, is the Lord the all-consuming passion of my life? I mean, let's be honest with these questions. If if we're going to be believers, if we're going to follow him, if we're going to love him like we're supposed to, do I have this this deep, intense, abiding affection for my Lord? Do I enjoy spending time with him? Do I brag on him to others? Do I tell him that I love him? Do, Do I talk with him as much as I can? Do we treat our relationship with God greater than any other we have on this earth? Because honestly, we should. This is really what all looks like. He wants every piece of us. He wants us to to know him as, as he knows us. Now remember, these things are not things we do to get God to love us, right? That's not what this is about. 
There are things we do because we love, we are loved by him and because we love him. This all encompasses a lifestyle as a response to his love. This is why we, we approach him in this way. This is why we serve him in this way. This is why we love him. Remember what's written in, in 1 John chapter 4? Love consists in this, that not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be the atoning sacrifice of our sins. We love him because he first loved us. As I just said, the, the way we live, the way we love is a response to who God is and even what he's done. To love God supremely, we've got to submit all we are to him. We've got to prepare to give him total control over our lives. We, we need his love to be able to love him in this way, right? Remember, this isn't about what we do. We're loving because he's given us this love first. When we accept his love because it is so great, it in turn allows us to love those around us, which, which is the second of these two commandments. We're commanded to love others genuinely. This is only possible because of God's love. And, and yet, so, as so often is the case, Jesus gives us more than we ask for. The, the religious lawyer asks which command is the most com important, and Jesus says there are two, and they go together. He says, these two commandments, you, you got to link them. How you respond to the first loving God determines how you respond to the second loving your neighbor. When, when you obey the second, it shows that you've embraced the first. Jesus shows us that love actually defines the lawful life. And he shows us that the law actually defines the loving life. And when Jesus says all the laws boil down to this, he, he's talking about loving God and loving your neighbor. He's saying, we've not fulfilled the law by simply avoiding what the law prohibits, but we also have to do and be what the law is really after. And that's namely love. This type of love that we're talking about is legitimately selfish. Listen, pay attention. Jesus gives us what we see in Leviticus chapter 19, verse 8, to complement Deuteronomy 6. It says there, do not take revenge or bear a grudge against members of your community, but love your neighbor as yourself. I am the Lord. So growing out of my love for God, I love those who have, who have been created in God's image. This, 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 this word neighbor, it's not used here in a restrictive sense. It's not about proximity. All of humanity, even, even my enemies are in view here. Some wrongly think Jesus, the unselfish one, is telling me to selfishly love myself, but, but that's not the case. So how do we make sense of this? Well, one, there's a, a healthy kind of self-love that recognizes we are the objects of both the creating and the redeeming love of our God. To, to hate myself is an offense to God, and it calls into question his wisdom and his goodness. Two, to, to love a person naturally as for himself is now turned out towards others. Three, the, the, the fact that this is a command makes clear that the primary focus is our actions and not our feelings. And four, there's, this, a certain, there's certainly a mysterious paradox for the same Jesus who tells us to love ourselves also tells us to deny ourselves, to, to die to ourselves. See, the more I rightly love myself, the more I will deny myself and love others. That's just how Jesus works. That's why this makes sense. I will serve the needs of others with all the energy and passion and zeal with which I attempt to meet my own needs. Imagine if this is how we lived. Imagine if the church put this into action in everything they did. Only by loving my God supremely will I be able to love others. And not just the others that are easy to love, but all others, even, even our enemies and not just love them like we might think about love, but love them genuinely. And as we do this, we demonstrate that our love is for God supremely. It, it's linked together. Do, do you understand how this all works? It's important that we get this to be able to live as Jesus calls us to live. No wonder 
Jesus said, there's, there's no other command greater than these. They had to go together. I, I, I came across a sermon that was preached way back in February of 2012. And it was at this, this Baptist seminar, uh, seminary. And it was, he preached it to, and, and well, I saw in it this, what it means to, to love others genuinely. And in it, this pastor encouraged the listeners to examine the context surrounding Leviticus 19.18 showing what loving your neighbor as yourself means. This is what he, he came across, this list of what it looks like when we love our neighbors as ourself. It means, it means you're going to care for the poor. It means you're going to not steal. You're not going to lie. You're, you're going to be fair in your business dealings. You're going to care for the deaf. You're going to care for the blind. You're going to deal justly with all. You're going to avoid slander. You're, you're not going to jeopardize the life of your neighbor. You're not going to harbor hatred against your brother. You, you'll go and rebuke your neighbor when necessary for their good or, or your good. You won't take revenge. You won't bear a grudge against others. That's what loving your neighbor looks like. That's, that's a genuine love for them. Genuine love is hard. Genuine love takes work. It takes the love of God in us and through us. That's the only way we can do it is because we know his love in our lives. All of that's found in Leviticus 19, 10 through 18. I encourage you, go back and read it for yourselves this week. View it in this context of this is, this is what God has told us. This is how we are to love. It's quite a list of how to love. I love that God doesn't leave it to our imaginations as to what it would mean for us. He tells us how to love our neighbors as ourselves. This love is one of true sacrifice. Here this, this scribe comes and asks this question, put, your place in, put yourself in his shoes, and, and how would you have responded if you'd been him and you heard Jesus' answer? His response is one of delight. <laughs> right? He, he affirms Jesus' creedal confession of, of this exclusive monotheism of, of the one true God. He, he affirms the comprehensive love, devotion, and worship of, of, of our God because he's worthy to receive it. He, he adds an insight that draws the praise and applause of Jesus to love God supremely, to love our neighbor genuinely, is far more important than all the burnt offerings and sacrifices. He got it. He got, he got this answer from Jesus, and, and he draws in this understanding of what he is actually saying. Real religion ultimately is a matter of the heart. Religious rituals always must give way to the superiority of a right relationship with God and others. Such spiritual insight finds its echo in the Old Testament at, at so many different points. Look, uh, 1 Samuel, for example, he says, Does the Lord take pleasure in burnt offerings and sacrifices as much as in obeying the Lord? Samuel says, Look, to, to obey is better than sacrifice. To pay attention is better than the fat of rams. Proverbs 21 Doing what is righteous and just is more acceptable to the Lord than sacrifice. And, and even in Hosea, we read, For I desire loyalty and not sacrifice, the knowledge of God rather than burnt offerings. Make, make sure we understand in loving God and others as we are commanded to, our faith is revealed through our actions. Finally, this, this love is crucial to salvation. Jesus was pleased with this scribe's answer. He, he tells him, you're not far from the kingdom of heaven. And what does Jesus mean by this? He doesn't mean you're so close, you just got to try harder. That's not what he's saying. He wasn't saying do more on your own or, or trust in yourself. He, rather, th this man has come to see that entering the kingdom of God is a matter of the heart uh, devotion and not hard duty. Hear this, obeying the rules, obeying the regulations will never get you into heaven because we can never measure up to God's perfect standard. No, I need a new me. I need a new heart. I need the grace and the mercy of my God who can make me a new creation in Christ. I, I need to draw near to Jesus who has brought the kingdom of God near. 
That's what the scribe needed. That's what you need. We, the, 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 everyone on this earth needs this. They need Jesus Christ. One draws near and, and enters the kingdom, not by religion, but by a relationship with Jesus Christ. A relationship that results in loving God supremely and loving others genuinely. The, the cross tells us that God, or that Jesus loves God supremely. It tells us that, uh, that he loves us genuinely. That's, that's why the Spirit moved John to write this. Look at this. Dear friends, let us love one another because love is from God and everyone who loves has been born of God and knows God. The, the one who does not love does not know God because God is love. God's love was revealed among us in this way. God sent his one and only son into the world so that we might live through him. Love consists in this, not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be the atoning sacrifice for our sins. Dear friends, if God loved us in this way, we also must love one another. No one has ever seen God. If we love one another, God remains in us and his love is made complete in us. What a beautiful passage. We love because love is from God. This is where we learn it. Real love, true love always has its source in him. And whoever loves with a God kind of love, it gives this evidence that they've been born of God. Christians who love this way demonstrate in an ongoing habit of life that they know who God is. They don't simply know about him. They know him intimately. They know him personally as a father. It, it's one thing to talk about love. It's something else entirely to show love. And our God is not one that just talks. He's not just a talking God. He, he's an acting God. He's a, a God that does things. He's a serving God. And we see it through the gospel of Jesus. We are loved and we will always be loved by our God who is love. And he wants to shower us with it. He, he wants to deluge us with it. it it's, it's his love to give and he wants to give it to us. How do we know? He gave us his son. He sent Jesus into this world to make sure that we don't miss this. John says it twice in this passage. God sent his son for you. He sent his son for me. Praise God for that. To love God is to love others. To, to love others is to love God. These, these two great commands, these two great loves, it's not just one answer here. Jesus says there's this and this and it goes together. So the question becomes, how are we loving? How are we loving God? How are we loving others today? That, that's really where we end. What's it look like in our life? How does it play out? Do, do we have this, this, this affection, this supreme love for God enough that it impacts the way we love others? In our house, there are times where I will say to my children, act like you love one another, right? Right? And we laugh about it. And we're like, come on, your brother and sister. But we can't act like we love God. It's not something we can, we can just play at. This is serious stuff. If we're called to love him above all else, do we? If, if we're called to, to love him with all we are, are we doing it? Do you see it impacting the way that you love those around you? That you love your neighbor like you're supposed to? Like I said, we can, we can think about this and we can get in our heads thinking, well, I've got to, it's not about us. God allows us to do this through his love. If we'll love as he's called us to, if we'll love because of who he is, he'll give us an abundance to give out to others. So how are you loving today? What's it look like in your life? How's it playing out for you? That's where I want you to be thinking as we move to our time of response this morning. This gentleman goes to, to Jesus to ask what may seem like a simple question, but man, look at what he got. He got the truth. He understood the ideas that Jesus was coming. He was so close to the kingdom. And again, it wasn't anything he had to do. 
It wasn't that he had to do more. It was that he had to accept Christ as he was for who he was. Are we there? Are we loving as God has loved us? Are we loving others as we're commanded to? Let's stand together as we pray. The team's going to come and lead us in our song of response this morning. Father God, once more, we thank you for this opportunity to, to get into your word. We thank you for this passage that Jesus answers this question, instructing us in what it looks like to, to uphold the greatest commands. And Father, what we see is, is it's all about love from you. The way we're to love you, the way we're to love others, and it's all because of you and what you've done. God, you loved us so fiercely that you send your only son to, to be the sacrifice for us. God, we thank you for that. And God, my prayer is that we see that sacrifice for what it is. We see that type of love that, that can manifest in our lives because of you. God, we don't do this in our own power. We don't do this because we're great. We do this because of you. So God, help us to love you as we're called to to love you supremely so that, Father, in turn, that love that you love us with will just allow, allow us to, to love the world around us. And God, these are, these are tall things. These are big orders. This isn't something we just can simply turn on in our life. You cause this. So God, help us to humble ourselves before you. If we're not loving the way we should, point out where that's going wrong. Reveal to us where we need to, to pursue you more, to know you more. And Father, help us to be bold enough to step out and follow Jesus' steps before us. So God, as we take this time to respond, I pray that you would open us up to what you have for us today, that you would guide us in our response and that you would find us faithful and that through this you would be honored and glorified. And we ask this in Jesus' name.